sand dunes in Eureka. So when you guys last saw us, Josie and I were at the uh, chimney tree and we had to run away from a dog. And then we drove all the way to Eureka and that's where we are today. You know why no one wants to see the pocket sand? Why? Them. Oh god. So we just left the Millel Dunes and now we're at Fort Humboldt uh, Historical Park. So come along with us as we explore. So the fort started off early life as a fort to defend Eureka against the Native Americans that would come to try to take some land back. During the Civil War though, they actually left and it was taken over by the California militia. And they took care of the fort during that time. This is the site of the old commissary and it's hard to see on the video but down the slope here is actually where they used to bring the weapons up on an old weapons road down by that car up to here. And U Ulysses S. Grant was stationed here as a quartermaster for a short time. Here in front of us is the surgeon's quarters. So we're basically where the doctor would live with his family. A while ago, California decided not to preserve a lot of this land, like in the early 1900s. So a lot of the buildings were scrapped or abandoned. Um, and then some were restored, which we see here today. And I think Josie's found the hospital, I believe. Let's go take a look. Tell us about the hospital. What do you read? What? There was an earthquake. Yeah. This is the Fort Hospital. It is the only original building from uh, the old Fort days. It was Humboldt's first telegraph office in 1906. It was also damaged in a 2010 earthquake, but is still standing. Um, unfortunately, right now they are renovating, so you can't go inside. Plus, we're still at the end of the pandemic, hopefully. People know about the bloodletting using leeches. What I didn't know is that they used to mix opium and alcohol as a way of making you feel better. Kind of like a morphine. Let's see what Josie learned. This guy made a fiddle made from the skull of his favorite mule. The mule's name was Dave. We've seen a lot of cats today and we should see more. I don't know if you can see him. There's a little cat. So right by that tent display, there's a lot of old foundations for old buildings. Like here's an office building foundation here, as well as officer quarters. You can see some of their foundation marks. Um, when they first arrived, they were just living in little tents. Um, then a few days later, they were finally able to build two-story barracks. But life was not easy out here. It was quite rough, and I can tell you it's quite cold even today. The officers had a lot better life. They would live, even from the onset, they had houses that they lived in alone or with their families, um, as well as having servants and other fine objects shipped from San Francisco. Major Rains was also a very important figure here at Fort Humboldt. Uh, he was an early on major, um, but he was not liked by a lot of the people around because he believed that Indians, the Native Americans were people as well and felt that they shouldn't be just slaughtered and he worked really hard to move a lot of them onto reservations and save their lives. So one of the problems with Fort Humboldt was at 1860, on the off break of the Civil War, a lot of federal troops left to go east to fight um, and that left a lot of militia groups. Militia groups that were able to then take over the fort here and then started calling for the destruction of the native population. Um, there's a quote, and I'm gonna read it here. Uh, basically, they built a corral somewhere, not, they don't know the exact location, they don't believe it was in Fort Humboldt, but it was built somewhere in the area, um, and a lot of Native Americans died, somewhere in the range of like two to 300. Um, and it's, Fort Humboldt though is considered a genocidal placed by many Native American people. In the 1930s, this was a lumber mill 
and it had one of the bloodiest strikes in Eureka's history, uh, where they were arguing over wages, because of course at the time you were being paid, you know, 35 cents a week, roughly, in pay. So they were fighting for more wages, and the police came, and as we know from the last several years, uh, the police escalated the situation and three people died um, due to gunshots from the police. In addition to the Fort Humboldt area, there's also a logging museum that we're going to walk you through now. So at the start of the gold rush, loggers started coming out as well, realizing that the large redwood trees in the area would be very valuable, um, almost to the point of bluejacks from Maine and Michigan traveled out in huge droves of people. Um, to come out here in log woods. This is an example of what would be a like logger's cabin, either for a boss or like an, if you had your own logging, you only work for yourself. Most log people, lumberjacks as we would call them, lived in tiny cramp, either tents or small buildings like this, but with several more people living in them. And they were gross and filled with bugs and because of working conditions, it was quite wet a lot of times as well. So lumberjacks of the era, the 1850s, prized their axes above all else. They would often even take them to church with them and kept them sharp and clean. Um, and a lot of times that's all they had between axes and then they had boards that they would put into the side of the tree to stand on, to chop. Uh, it was a lot of grueling work back in the day. Example of the stump of a redwood. And this would have been where you would stick your piece of wood in so you could then stand up higher and chop at this level. The tree fell down, there was barkers whose job was to remove the bark from the tree, and then they would chop it into smaller sections like these where they could then much easier to move and bring it in on a lot of oxen or donkeys down roads. In 1852, Captain James Ryan was sailing his steamboat into Eureka and it got damaged on the way into the bay, so then he ended up beaching it and built a factory around it, and that's how he started his wood business. Also in this museum, they have some old milling equipment. This is an old shingle mill, and then you have a steam donkey, as well as another steam engine of some sort. Steam engines are steam donkeys. So these would replace donkeys and oxen and pulling up trees over to rivers and roads, making it easier for people to harvest. And they're on these giant sleds so they could be moved, but they were heavy enough that they could pull a log. Example of a steam donkey. So you can see it's basically a steam powered winch. You can see the winch mechanism all the way there. This is the Washington slack line. And this is the largest steam donkey ever built. It's pretty amazing how big this is. It's probably at least 30 feet tall. And this was a very dangerous job as they would be pulling wood, these giant logs through the forest. And a lot of times the rope would snap and it would not be a good time if you're in the way. The donkeys were involved. It was only natural that we started using trains as well. So this would have been a personnel carrier to carry workers out further into the woods along the line. And then this is obviously a log carrier to bring them back. Inside this shed here though, we do have two locomotives. We have an Anderson locomotive, it's the family that donated it. But it's from the Bear Harbor Lumber Company, number one. And on this side we have the fault one. It's a little bit older locomotive as well. As you can tell by the wooden structure around where you'd be operating the locomotive. In the 1920s, we started seeing diesel tractors and they started using them on these arches, which would allow a tractor to pull a log through the woods it became more and more inaccessible. Say it, Bills. Say it. You say it. How you doing? 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 <laughs>